everyone should receive a message that pops up on their screen that says that this meeting is being recorded and it may also be aired or will be aired on Facebook and other YouTube channels. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm calling to order the July 10th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly at 2.04 p.m. With the extension of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And I'm just gonna do our usual sound check to make sure everyone can hear and be heard. And I'm gonna start uh, with you, Hala, welcome. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, and Jennifer? Hi, I can hear and see everyone. Okay, great. And Dr. Rhodes? I'm here and I can hear and see everyone. Excellent. Pamela? I'm here and can hear and see everyone. Excellent, we can hear you. And Dr. Shabazz? Yes, I'm connected. All right, welcome. Ms. Bridges? I can see and hear you. All right, excellent. And Yvonne? Yes, I can see and hear you. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to um, get us started with our first period of public comment. We haven't met for a couple weeks, so uh, welcome back. And uh, we'll start with uh, our first period of public comment, and then we will have a second period of public comment later in the meeting. We do have a guest joining us. Councillor Lopes will be joining us shortly. Um, so while she's making her way here, I'm going to go ahead and call for public comment. I'll read the public comment statement uh, once, and if other people join later, I'll read it again at the second period. During the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your name, pronouns, and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair based upon the number of people who wish to speak. The AHRA will not engage in a dialogue, but as always, we'll be listening very closely. And if we can answer any questions, we certainly will try to do that. So if you would like to make comment, uh, public comment, please go ahead and use the raise hand function and we will um, bring you in. Okay, so we do have some attendees. Um, I'm not seeing any raised hands at this time, but as I said, we'll have a second uh, period of public comment later. So before we jump in and um, Jennifer, feel free to bring Councillor Lopes Anika in anytime and we'll just make sure that she can hear us and be heard. She's done. Yes. Hi, Anika. Hi, everyone. Excuse me, I'm coming. I'm just grabbing a water. Feel free, take your time. We're gonna we're gonna go over a couple things first. So um, okay. whenever you're ready, no problem. Yeah, take your time. I'll just I'm just gonna take like just a few minutes to get water. Excellent. Okay. So um, I wanted to, since we haven't met for a few weeks, just to review on a public meeting some of the timeline pieces that uh, we've talked about or that I've sent you um, via email. So in terms of our timeline here, uh, we are going to be presenting to the town council our final report and recommendations um, on August 21st. So that will be at the regular town council meeting on August 21st. As that time approaches and we um, and we have a better sense of when our presentation will be, I'll of course make everybody aware of that. 
It will be wonderful to have as many of us there as possible. Um, our committee is still in existence, so we're still a body. Um, and so we'll probably have Jennifer post meeting uh, either way for that night, just so that we'll we'll call ourselves to order and make our presentation. So that means um, we have the next one, two, let's see. Um, we'll want to get we'll want to get the report and recommendations to the clerk by the 17th of August, um, no later than that. So it can be placed in the public packet and any presentation materials that we have, if we're going to do a slideshow, uh, will also be placed in the public packet by the 17th. So uh, looking at the schedule, I just wanted to quickly check with folks about the next several Mondays to see if you have any sense that you might not be available. Um, that would be July 17th, 24th, and 31st, and then uh, August 7th and 14th. And if you don't have a good sense or grasp on that right now, that's not a problem. Just let me know. Um, I think we'll probably plan to post for um, as many of those weeks as possible, but let's, again, we'll revisit that at the end of this meeting so that we can um, determine uh, where we're at in terms of the report. Can you put the dates in the chat? Jennifer, is that allowed to put the dates in the chat or okay? Can you repeat them more slowly then I'll, I'll write it down. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's the next three Mondays in July, the 17th, the 24th, and the 31st, and then August 7th and 14th. And that would be at our regular meeting time. And then We'll want to have our report and recommendations and any visual presentation materials ready to go to the clerk of the council by Thursday, the 17th of August. And then we will present on August 21st at the regular town council meeting. And as that uh, date approaches, Lynn will give me a better sense of timing and then I'll pass that on. Um, to you. Is, Are there any other questions about timeline right now or about just because I know there was a little bit of confusion about whether we were finished in June and we are our charge. We asked the clerk of the council to look at the charge and our charge actually says that we are finished either in June or at the um, presentation of our final report. And so this worked out really well in terms of council meetings as well for us to do this on the 21st. And hopefully Alexis will maybe be able to join us. <laughs> that will be really great. <laughs> maybe with a baby. <laughs> um, all right, so if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to just provide a quick overview in terms of updates. Um, there have been some meetings that have occurred since the last time that we met that I'm gonna give just a high level overview on. And then as we get into the meat of the draft report, there'll be some more specifics. Um, and after I do this overview, we'll, if um, Councillor Lopes is ready at that time, we'll welcome Councillor Lopes. And as I do this, I'll explain uh, what's happening with that. So Dr. Rhodes and I had an opportunity to meet with Sean last week. And Sean is our director of finance for the town. And it went really well. We had an excellent conversation with Sean. I think um, he really grasped everything very quickly as usual um, and gave us some uh, suggestions that when we get into the meat of talking about the report, we'll, uh, Dr. Rhodes and I will share that with you. I will also be meeting tomorrow uh, with Lynn and Paul, and I'm going to meet with them to one, give them a sense of where we're at, timeline, what sorts of recommendations we're thinking about, um, think about how we might uh, present on the 21st, and then also to review the legal questions that I'll be um, 
passing over to Paul to get responses from the legal counsel regarding. Um, so if there's anything that anybody would like me to specifically address with Lynn or Paul in that meeting tomorrow, then uh, please just let me know. You could tell me tell me now or after the meeting at any point, just call, text, email. Um, so those are sort of the, um, the higher level updates. And like I said, when we get to the report, we'll talk about uh, Sean's feedback and, and maybe Dr. Rhodes will jump in on that as well. So we have, uh, Anika, how is this timing for you? I'm good, I'm here, I'm hydrated. <laughs> All right, okay. perfect. Um, so, oh. I'm here. Hi. <laughs> we just somehow got Mara Keen into the, into the panel. I don't know what happened there. Uh, let's see. Sometimes two will come in together. I don't know. <laughs> Jennifer, are you able to move more back into the audience? I can. I'm not sure how that happened <laughs> at all, but. <laughs> all right. So I have asked Anika to join us today. Uh, we had a really great conversation with Ms. Bridges last week. If you recall, I think it was uh, at our last meeting, which is now a few weeks ago, the committee asked me to be in touch with Councillor Lopes regarding any recommendations that we may have surrounding ancestral bridges um, and some of the historical work that has already begun um, going years back uh, that Anika's grandfather and Ms. Bridges' father um, began in the community. So we had that conversation and something really, really um, amazing occurred over Juneteenth weekend. Um, and I wanted Anika to come and to speak to the committee directly uh, regarding that. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Anika, and, uh, and then we'll hopefully have an opportunity for people to ask questions or um, just have like an open conversation um, after you are finished. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I was asked uh, specific, hello. Uh, I was asked specifically to speak on the West Side District. Um, but if there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Uh, so yes, the, um, the West Side, the National the Historic West Side District, um, the you know oldest African American neighborhood in Amherst, Afro Indigenous as well, uh, was established. Well, was noted um, in the National Register of Historic Spaces in in two thousand. So well, where that might seem like it was a long time ago, even longer is the backstory behind that. As I'm sure you can all imagine, that was no easy plight. Um, that was through, you know, my grandfather Dudley Bridges, but also should be noted that, you know, many other, many other members of these first families were involved. My great grandfather Gil Roberts as well. So these were um, initiatives that even before um, it was done, uh, again went on for for many decades. So um, back in, I guess when we first returned, 2019. That's you know been been in on the agenda uh, for ancestral bridges really, you know, since then and, you know, and even before. So what was really significant about the day was that um, June 17th, um, there's a couple of reasons that it was significant in regards to Juneteenth. Um, it was the day that Juneteenth was established as a national holiday. Uh, and we're also, of course, we were uplifting those who, you know, are from Amherst, went to, uh, we're in the 54th and the 5th Calvary. So, you know, of course, some were there in Texas on that day and then came back to live out their lives in Amherst. Um, it was also significant as the 17th was Dudley Bridges' birthday. And, you know, it just it felt like this was 23 years just in the making of just having that, you know, recognition of, you know, some very, you know, humble folks that have just gone for decades and decades to get, to get their history, which was really lesser known, you know, in Amherst or outright erased to be recognized. 
Um, it should you know, be noted that these were folks, they were so old school that new black people to them were black people that came to town in the 60s and 70s. You know, that's just how old school they were and how long um, you know, these initiatives had been going on. So it, you know, this was a way of just doing like, and of course, to be noted, this work wasn't done for it just to be noted in a Google search. There was, there's also a lot of information within those Google searches that were left out that we have, you know, in documents that my grandfather left in videotape from both himself and my great grandfather speaking on these. So it's really, you know, was just a, a start and the least that we could do to have those efforts um, acknowledged. Thank you, Anika. And just in case, because there are people in the audience, I just want to make it clear, um, because many of us know Anika um, as a, a counselor um, representing district, I should know this three, right? It sounds like it's a three four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and also the executive director of Ancestral Bridges. So I just wanted to sort of tie that together for anybody who may be listening um, and is not aware. And Anika, did you share just in terms of what sort of what what occurred on the 19th in terms of the unveiling and what in terms of this committee? Um, how we might support the ongoing efforts or whatever needs to happen. Um, and it, it's not something that you necessarily have to answer now, but just to say that that question is out there and how the HRA may support the effort to continue and to be brought you know, um, fully to, to fruition the way that it, it's been envisioned. Well, thank you. And, um, and yes, yeah, so we'll have, you know, further conversations, but I think just the, you know, um, you know, I'm learning rather that a lot of people had no idea about the West Side District um, and that it existed um, and that it had already been acknowledged and had already been in um, the registrar. So I think, you know, and also just having this information out there because it's, it's one of many areas that we have mapped out in the Ancestral Bridges um, walking tour, which is the first descendant led walking tour celebrating the black and Afro indigenous families in the region. Uh, we have all of those maps there, but what is really um, in my mind significant about this West Side District and others that you really see, like if you're looking at redlining, if you're looking at the tracks, you really see how it follows these areas. Um, there are so many who are left out, I can't even tell you, because when we talk about archivists, we have to think about what the archivists have access to, who was considered important at that time, who did they get this information from. Many of this history has been rewritten for numerous reasons. So, you know, I think where the, um, well, I know where the AHRA can be most helpful is with helping this, this information really be uplifted factually, because again, there is a lot that has been left out. There are a lot of areas where homes that were there have not, they're not there anymore. There are a lot of people who at this time, you know, they didn't own homes. There are very few that built their home or own their own home. So many were, you know, renting in various areas up and down along the tracks. Um, throughout Amherst, there were many households where there were multiple families within the households. So as you can see, you know, they moved. So if they could have been on Baker, on Snell, they, you know, moved around where there was room, where there was space, and also out of the area. You know, you're, you're talking about a time it was very hard to get by. So a lot of people had to, you know, leave the area. Um, a good number, a majority of them were with, with Amherst College, but many had to leave the area just to be able to provide for their families. And that could have been overseas and that could have been Springfield, you know, or wherever in between. But, you know, there are so many families and names that are left out of archives and other documents that it's really, you know, when you hear those, especially those who had the good fortune to live for 106 years. I mean, imagine what they had seen. So, you know, they're able to speak not only of their memories, but of the memories of their parents and grandparents and really, you know, um, put this together. And, you know, we're just so fortunate that because they, you know, it was such a small community that this is, you know, through oral history, especially, but also through documents that really connect when you hear like there was an un 
uh, an unnamed non-white person who lives somewhere. You know, a lot of these names filter through. So, you know, we have, we're able to connect them, but this is of, you know, work that has spanned on for decades and decades. So um, I'd imagine that this could be a, a close and very important um, partnership and information for AHRA to help uplift and get out to the community. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. And, and absolutely. And we want to make sure that in our report, um, that all of that, as you said, uh, Anika is factually documented with its history and, um, and, and that's our goal here and, and for the purpose of having this, uh, discussion. So I would like to open the floor to see if any of the other members of the committee or if Pamela or Jennifer have questions, uh, for Councillor Lopes, um, and and this certainly doesn't have to be, you know, the last conversation. I hope it won't be the last conversation that we're having. Um, but if there are questions, this is the time. I just I just have a quick question. You had named where the historical West Side was district was uh, registered. Can you repeat that name, please? Of the of the area, not the area, but the where it was registered at. Oh, so it's a national register of historic places. If you just Google, like if you if you Google, um, you'll you'll see that it comes up. So it's like it's not a and to be to noted. Some people have called it like a a local historic district. There's a big difference. So this is a national. Yeah. Historic if you allow me to share screen, I can show you the the listing for the National Register for the state of Massachusetts. Um, the And uh, if you want to uh, take note of the link that I've put there to distribute um, in our uh, in a future occasion, that's fine as well. The um, the this is really a Dr. Uh, Shabazz, a before you go on, let me ask Jennifer to give you um, the ability to share a screen so you can decide when to, to bring that up if you'd like as you're talking. Okay. Um, so I think she's working on that. Go. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Well, I just really want to say how um, integral I think this information is and, and, and the need to highlight the West Side Historical District and the work of Ancestral Bridges and um, Anika's grandfather, Deborah's father, uh, it, it, it really goes to the core of one of the five areas of, uh, of harm that we, we have talked about uh, as part of reparative justice, and that's the idea of peoplehood, the, the awareness that people of African descent, Black people, have lived in this town, have contributed to this town, have been a part of this town, despite the legacy of slavery and of structural racism. In the way of Black folks, a way of, that, that we say it is, they made a way out of no way, okay? And, and this is what comes through and is so important to, be, uh, to really be highlighted um, the work that was done, as as um, uh, Nico Lopes has, has uh, stated, you know, for for generations. I mean, going back well beyond the folks that have come here since the '60s. Um, this this presence of black home ownership, of black people making a way out of no way in this town, and uh, and it's just something that is really important to uh, to be highlighted. Um, the West Side Historic District, as it shows on the uh, the website of the National Register, concerns Baker Street, Snell Street, Northampton Road, Hazel Avenue. Uh, it is of historical significance in terms of architecture, engineering, as well as uh, what is categorized as event. That is to say, the the history of the town. Um, it is it, uh, as far as architectural style, the homes there were bungalow craftsmen, colonial revival, and the area of significance historically concerns architectural history, European history, black history, 
agriculture, community planning and development with the specific periods of importance being 1950 to 1974, 1925 to 1949, 1900 to 1924, 1875 to 1899, and 1850 to 1874. And so the other category they put it under historic function is agriculture, subsistence, industry, processing, extraction, and an interesting category, domestic. Um, so, you know, it, it, um, it is one of a very few, very few for the entire state of Massachusetts of historic districts that are, uh, that reflect a um, African heritage presence, African American history in this, uh, uh, in the state. And so it, it really needs to be preserved, what, whatever may remain, as well as to be uh, part of the, the education and, and presentation of the history of the town. So I so welcome and relish the uh, uh, installation of, uh, of markers. I relish the uh, uh, many ways in which um, AHRA can can serve to amplify the need for this uh, this particular history of all our historic districts and of all our historic places to be to be elevated as part of the work of um, uh, of reparative justice and broadening the history broadening the history of of this of this town. Yes, th thank you, Shabazz, and I would also um, encourage you all to again where you you know I know sometimes if if information is new and you're reading about it and it's exciting on you know the Google to really um, be in discussion uh, with ancestral bridges because we have the backstories we have those that have not been included we have those who have been erased from this um, discussion uh, we have you know the information that Dudley Bridges left you know including what had not been done what had been changed what had kind of been rewritten by those who wouldn't have thought that you know the black community who had been here you know who who were not scholars or recognized in such a way would have access to and you know as we see that you know this often happens whether it is, you know, the black community, the Afro indigenous community, the indigenous community, we were not in the beginning, we were not made to know our histories anyway. We certainly were not made to tell them and be the authority of them. And so, you know, we do have this information there. So then I, I ask of you, as I know, sometimes when people get excited, these things become split and split and split. But so we can really, you know, honor those who, you know, work so hard and they, you know, they didn't have an HRA behind them. They didn't have 2020 and the awakening behind them. I mean, these were just people doing what they were doing and what they had always done. And you know, not wanting to be erased for it because they wanted to see themselves represented. Represented because we all know, um, you know, that there's sometimes nothing like seeing yourselves represented. But you know, mainly also for you know future generations and for their descendants. You know, we were here and we are here. Uh, and, you know, so this, this story and the story of the West Side District has been, you know, really, you know, we talked about this, you know, in discussion in our, you know, the, in Juneteenth of 2021, Shabazz, we were there for that, um, you know, and also your own committee member, Deborah Bridges has been saying this within the Civil War Tablet exhibit since its um, debut on June 19th, 2021. So it's really nice to, you know, see this being, you know, embraced now and, you know, um, being counterful. But I think that all we can do to really keep that, keep this information tight and together and avoid pulling it apart um, and, you know, make, making assumptions, though, you know, those who worked very hard for this to happen and didn't have, you know, the advantages of social medias and Zooms and 2020, you know, they didn't have that. So I think it's, you know, really important that we make sure that this is led and rolled out as they worked for and as they would have wanted. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, one of the things that we talked about when uh, Anika and, and Ms. Bridges and I met is 
as we are working on the iterations of our report, just to be able to share what we're sort of synthesizing with Anika and with Ms. Bridges to ensure that we got that we're getting whatever we're putting out there right <laughs> um, and factual and um and so thank you so much, Anika, for being here. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and I just want to ask if, again, if there are any questions from committee members or from Pamela or Jennifer um, pertaining to this or to, to any, we're going to be in continued conversation regarding um, recommendations um, uh, more broadly uh, uh, regarding ancestral bridges. And that's something that we um, have agreed we will continue to discuss over the coming days and weeks and hope to have Anika back again um, to be able to sort of go more deeply into that. But I did want us to talk about the West Side District today. So um, well, Anika, congratulations on this. It's a huge, it's thank you um, just for being here to share this and um, for us to be able to um, do what we can um, in the time that we have left here to uplift the work. And um, if there are no other questions, you can, of course, feel free to stay <laughs> um, as if you don't have anything else to do. Um, but also uh, feel free. Um, we'll definitely be in touch soon. Well, I'm, I'm going to head out. I may have stayed a little bit longer to hear all of you are doing, especially if you had Rocky with you. But other <laughs> than that, I, I, I do have a lot to do. But um, yes, let's Please be in touch and, uh, you know, keep you posted about, you know, when those signs will go up so we can, you know, stand together with that, whether as your for committee or individuals, however that works. Awesome. Okay. Great. Have a great Thank rest you. of the day. Okay. You too. Thank you. Just wanting to highlight it again uh, later. Um, uh, Michelle, if you will send out that link, if people go to it, they'll see on the website of the National Register of Historic Places that Hampshire County, uh, Massachusetts has 50 places on the register. And if you um, just, you know, look for the metadata of those that connect with any aspect of Black history, um, it's only, uh, there, there are only three. And that is the West Cemetery, which has the section with African Americans who are buried there, including Doug, Dudley Bridges, by the way. Uh, it has um, uh, Goodwin AME Church, and it has um, the the West Side Historic District. Those are the those are the only places for the entire county of Massachusetts of Hampshire County. There's nothing in, in anywhere else. There's nothing in Northampton. There's nothing in uh, Belchertown. There's nothing in anywhere else in Hampshire County um, with any type of black history, except for those uh, three sites that are national heritage listed. And the simple way you do it for the metadata is just go control F and hit black and it'll take you to the three listings. And it, as I said, it's only the West Cemetery, the black section there, it's um, the uh, uh, West Side Historic District that Ancestral Bridges is elevating uh, to our attention, to the town's attention. And it is the um, uh, Goodwin uh, AME Church. So just, just pointing that out, if folks want to look at it any further. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. And I will um, send or ask Jennifer to send this link um, to assembly members. Um, that would be... Yes. That would be great. All right, thank you. I'm gonna just stop this. Okay. All right. So um, let's before before we get into the draft of the report, the executive summary of the report, just checking in with folks to see if there are any um, other questions regarding uh, that or the timeline. Also wanting to check to see when people need to leave today so that I have a sense of how to flow the rest of the meeting. Um, so Dr. Shabazz, quickly, what what's your, okay, I see Ms. Bridges is three. Um, Dr. Rhodes. Uh, let's see. I 
I, I can do till 3.30. Okay, uh, Yvonne? Three. Three, okay, uh, Hala? 3.30. And Dr. Shabazz? Yeah, I'm, I'm blocked out for as much time as we need for today. Okay, so let's, we'll sort of meet in the middle there and probably try to wrap up by 3.15. I, I don't wanna go over too, too much without uh, a couple of our assembly members here. So let me um, pull up the, just give me one second. All right. Can everybody see my screen now? Yes. Okay. And did everybody have a chance to take a look at the draft? Uh, this is the executive summary of the report. Yes. Great. Uh, Yvonne, you didn't have a chance yet? Okay, no worries. Um, so, in fact, Mattia has uh, been working quite a bit on the report, I think, today. So I made a copy of what, what we started with so that Mattia can continue to go into her original document. And so what we're looking at is a copy of that um, as it was uh, finished, I think, at the end of not this past week, but the week before, Mattia was on vacation this past week. So whatever has been updated uh, today or in the next day or so, I'll be sending that out to folks or sending that to the committee um, for, for our next meeting. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start here just in terms of the general outline of the report. Uh, we, <clears throat> Are beginning, as you can see with the executive summary, uh, we've noted here that the intro paragraph will be written last. And the reason for that is uh, Dr. Shabazz at our last meeting brought up, I thought something that was, was really important um, in that we, there is a history um, of our committee. There's a history of how uh, reparations and the discussions around reparations have begun in this community, um, even before uh, the murder of George Floyd and the petition that Reparations for Amherst worked on, there's a history that even goes back before that, um, that Matthew Andrews and Dr. Shabazz and others were having. So what I thought was, um, let's see how our report sort of comes together, and then we can go back and put that intro in um, to really honor um, sort of the fullness of, of the landscape here. Um, and then uh, we have our appendices as we know of them so far. I'm sure this will be added to um, and we'll want to review that. And then here uh, we're starting here with a brief history and then some of the select findings that the reparations for Amherst group um, discovered in their research reports. So there is a there's a this particular structure I've asked Mattia to look at the California reparations report. I thought they did an, ex an excellent job in their executive summary of looking at the national versus the state of California so that it gave the reader, whoever the, you know, we're gonna have lots of different audiences reading this, but so that it gave the reader a sense of um, the, the harms that have occurred on a national level in various, you know, whether we're talking about housing, education, health, um, and then also to be able to say in Amherst, this is how it looks. Um, and, and of course, this is only partially what we've discovered in our in our work. So there this is a, a this is a, a, a growing um, body of work, really. Um, and I'm just going to go through this quickly and then we'll have a chance to open open it up for questions here. 
Um, and then, of course, we have uh, the a little bit about the town's commitment to end structural racism. We have our charge and the pertinent information from our charge. And then the findings and recommendations. So we begin with um, this question of who is eligible for reparations that we've been discussing. Um, Dr. Shabazz put together an excellent uh, analysis for us um, that was his perspective that we then discussed um, in meetings together. And this is um, sort of the synthesized version of that. Um, so we've talked about concentric circles. Uh, we've talked about uh, the group one being at the center, the descendants of African heritage people who were enslaved in Amherst. Um, and then as Dr. Shabazz explained to us in our last meeting, we go out from there. And again, I'm just gonna quickly keep going through and then we'll come back um, into each area here. And then we have our recommendations. Um, or we've be, we've be, we've started to outline our recommendations starting with the successor committee. Um, establishing a town meeting for African heritage residents. We've talked about that being biannual. Um, and then establishing a $2 million reparations account um, and uh, cultivating additional funding streams. Uh, Town-wide programming on truth and reconciliation. So all of these we've already discussed and now they've been put into this draft. Uh, developing a town policy for renaming streets and spaces. And I do want to say, in light of the conversation that we just had today about the West Side District, um, Mattia will be updating this to, um, to recognize that the West Side District has, in fact, um, been um, established. And so I think it says somewhere in here that uh, that there hasn't been, uh, there are no roads, no squares, no markers. So this is where we'll uh, be able to expand on the West Side piece that Councilor Lopes just spoke about. Um, and then we have some um, other recommendations that we are working on, including the University of Massachusetts, the reparations for Professor Edwin Driver, um, Amherst College and the Coleman family home. Um, and any other recommendations we may have there. And then um, this piece around a townwide resolution in support of state and federal reparations, which we do have, um, we do have something and I have to actually go back and look at what that is. So let me, let me stop the share quickly and just open the floor up just sort of broadly. Um, for people who have questions or comments in terms of the overall structure that we're uh, working with. And I see that Dr. Shabazz has his hand raised. Yes, uh, thank you again for all of the work going forward and in, in, uh, putting this together. Uh, I think this does um, uh, gather together a great deal of um, of what we we have worked on and what we have uh, spoken about and I think begun to reach some consensus on. Um, I would like to say in the select findings on the history of structural racism in Amherst, one, uh, those are several very good bullets, but one uh, that I think is missing uh, that we had, you know, that it's come up over our work is, of course, Amherst College. Um, there's mention there of, of UMass and of the, uh, uh, you know, what happened toward uh, Dr. Edwin Driver. We can possibly even flesh some of that out a little bit more in, in terms of UMass, but, but there's no bullet about um, uh, Amherst College, and I think it really helps to uh, amplify uh, I mean, that that's a major institution in our town, and yet we have the research that is going on already on the Amherst College campus and research that has already been very well established, showing the linkage through uh, former trustee Israel Trask or, or, and some of the founding trustees of where the very wealth that helped to establish Amherst College was tied to slavery, slavery in the slave trade. So um, I uh, uh, I think there is a a, uh, a a an important bullet that might be might be placed on that there. 
got other things down the line, but I'll, I don't want to hold the mic too long. Okay. And just to note that Mattia is in the audience. So um, she's here observing and, and noting um, any, any feedback that's coming. Um, so any other uh, questions or comments about the overall structure of the report? I, I do, given the timing, it's really important that Dr. Rhodes and I have an opportunity to share with you uh, what we learned in our conversation with Sean um, and to be able to present to you what Sean's feedback was. Um, and so if, if that's okay with the committee, I'd love to be able to take this moment. And Dr. Rhodes, does that sound right to, to review with the group what we talked with Sean about? Uh, yes. Okay. Do you want to, do you want, would you like to do it or would you like me to start why it? You, why don't you start and, sure. and then I'll get my notes. Go ahead. Okay. So, you know, I, I don't know how familiar folks are with Sean, but um, he is a very open-minded and creative person. And he's very good at sort of taking in information and taking uh, what people are trying to do and then um, trying to find solutions for that. Um, and I really appreciate that about him. He's also the director of finance. So he is the person that uh, works most or one of the people that works most closely with the budget and with the town manager. So he really understands um, I think it's important to preface that the conversation we had with Sean was um, he can't, you know, Sean wasn't there telling us, <laughs> making any promises, put it that way, about anything. He was simply um, giving us some feedback about how we might look at uh, the, the recommendations, particularly the recommendations around the fund, of course. So we, uh, Dr. Rhodes and I, uh, reviewed with Sean what we were envisioning, um, and, and that being the successor committee, that being the biannual town meeting. Um, we talked about uh, the model of the CPA. Um, we talked about cannabis and the declining revenue. And so what, the, what that means for us as a committee whose funds have been committed based on cannabis, annual cannabis revenue. Um, we've also, uh, we also had the opportunity to talk about how the funds may be used, whether uh, special legislation would be required or not. So that was sort of the basis. And initially, we pitched the idea of having a dollar figure that this committee would say, okay, you know what, for example, unless we have $50,000 per year starting in FY25 to use toward reparation initiatives, we can't really do much until this fund is fully funded in 10 years. Um, and so that's a problem. And so the solution or the proposed uh, sort of way that Sean encourages to think about this is instead of asking uh, the town to sort of pretend that the money is in there and then work uh, on some formula that would require several different um, appropriations to occur, various votes from the town council, um, he he suggested instead that we try to get the money into the account quick, more quickly um, so that we, uh, that our recommendation would be to um, sort of escalate the time timeline or push the timeline um, more quickly um, by making a recommendation that would uh, sort of forego the cannabis piece and say, okay, uh, we want to get to the $2 million instead of in 10 years and five years. And this is how we recommend uh, that happening. This is what we're asking the town council to do. Um, the other piece, and then I'm going to let, uh, I not let, ask Dr. Rhodes um, to, to jump in here, but 
the other piece I think that Sean um, cautioned us about is the formation of a, of a committee. And I know that it seemed at least that we had our hearts set on having a successor body. Um, but his sense was if we could sort of get the policies in place, he thought the idea of the uh, town meeting um, was excellent. He said he thought it was different enough that um, it would be something that people would be in, really interested in, but that perhaps there is a way for us to create recommendations for the CPA committee, as well as to the town manager on the community block grant funds um, that would that would that would be um, within the sort of um, realm of reparative justice. Um, so I'm going to pause there. Dr. Rhodes, jump in. And and what did I forget? Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, yeah. Uh, my recollection is that uh, he wasn't telling us not to do a committee. In fact, I was thinking that the uh, the we needed a successor committee. There is no way for us to uh, ensure that our wishes are taken forward without a successor committee, similar to what happened happened with the uh, the uh, with Crest coming on board, and then the uh, CSG, whatever that came. Uh, there's no way for us to do it. That's one. So having that successor committee is important. If we have the successor committee, then it is possible for the successor committee to utilize the funds that are available in conjunction with funds that are available, say via CPA, et cetera, and do matching fund kinds of things for, for uh, purposes of AHRA objectives. In other words, you, you can double your funds by matching up say uh, the uh, AHRA successor says, hey, we want 50,000 to go towards A. And that had, that impacts the CPA. And CPA, would you throw in, we're requesting you to throw in another 50,000 so that we now have $100,000 going forward to do a particular project. So I, I, that's, that's what I heard uh, coming up. The other thing is that um, money, that we already have about four hundred thousand plus in there. Uh, I, I don't I don't see abandoning the cannabis model going forward. We just need to solidify that to make sure that stays there. Whatever amount of money there is, it should go there. In addition to that, uh, the, the, the suggestion I heard is how do we then uh, multiply that? or amplify that amount of money uh, via uh, the town council uh, and asking for additional funds so that you're able to accelerate the amount of money going into the, uh, the fund. But it cannot be either or, it has to be both. If you make it either or, then you are fighting, you know, it's, it's oppositional and not very good. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, that's it for me. Okay, Dr. Rhodes, I think we did hear two different things on Sean's recommendation on the committee. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I'm looking back at my notes. Um, what I, and, and, and we can make whatever recommendations we want, but just to be clear, what, what I heard on the committee is that Sean felt like creating another CPA type committee would add. Uh, yeah, Do you remember I, yeah. that? No, I, yeah, I, I wasn't saying creating another type of CPA committee. Definitely not. Okay. I'm talking about a successor group to the AHRA. I see. And that okay. AHRA successor, successor group would be responsible for uh, dispensing funds on a going forward basis. And they, they would do it in conjunction with other groups such as the CPA that has funds so that you can do matching funds. Uh, and and, and, and that, that is an important thing. The other important thing was the uh, uh, a Black Town Council. 
the Black uh, Town Hall. Town, yeah. town Hall that would inform a meeting. this particular group going forward, our successor group going forward. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I, I think, uh, again, I think we can, we can make whatever recommendation we want around that, but um, the idea was to try, I think, to tap into, like, so we know for CPA that there's uh, affordable housing, historic preservation, open space, um, and there's a fourth one that I'm not remembering. Dr. Shabazz, what is it? <laughs> Yes, recreation, exactly. So if we could, as uh, Dr. Rhodes said, have initiatives that come through that fall into one of those categories that also meet the needs of reparative justice, um, then we would basically have a, a potential matching situation where we would say the, the, the reparations fund is coming in with X amount and we're asking CPA to come in with X amount um, for this particular initiative that falls under the category of affordable housing, for example. But Sean also felt that there were other sources such as the CBDG or CB, yeah, the community block grants um, right. that where those recommendations go directly to the town manager. He gets that pot of money and he determines how that money is used every year. So we we would be making recommendations directly or the successor body would be making direct, direct recommendations to him. Um, and then again, um, the idea was to ask the council to accelerate the fund so that we make the $2 million commitment, we get there quicker. Um, and that is through some combination of continuing to do what uh, we've already been doing and then to um, add an additional amount from say free cash each year so that we can cut this timeline down, you know, maybe in half or whatever it is this committee would like to recommend. So let's just pause there and see um, what questions and, and, and thoughts there are around, around that. And can how, you, oh, please, repeat, Yvonne. Yeah. Can you repeat why he felt we didn't need to have another committee? Yeah. And then also to add to that, um, I'm just curious about how um, the work that we've done will will move forward. Because, you know, like, a, uh, and correct me, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm not sure how long it takes to get things moving. But if we also put forth this Black Assembly, um, would they be moving the work forward? I just feel like there there won't be any oversight to yeah. you know, work moving forward. I think, thanks, it's a great question, Yvonne. I think, so again, this is what I heard and we can touch base again with Sean. I think his concern about the creation of another committee is just sort of the amount of um, resources that are required to have a committee of the council running. So you have to have people who want to be on the committee. Um, you have to be able to go through a pro the town manager has to go through a process of vetting those people, making sure that that committee um, has members as well as staffing the committee. You have to have staff liaisons who are available to staff. So Another model might be that we have a plan. We're, we're handing over a plan essentially that includes having this Blacktown meeting on a biannual basis. And perhaps it goes to the DEI department. I'm just coming up with this in, in my you know head right now, is perhaps it goes to the DEI department and the DEI department is sort of the holder and, and overseer of the plan that we um, put forward. Uh, so again, I do think that there's a really good case to have a successor body. And on the other hand, I know how much it takes to keep a committee rolling and having people that are willing to participate in the committee. Um, and with the Black Town meeting in place, if it's happening twice or three or four times a year, to bring Black folks together and building on the BAM membership, um, it may be that 
having a whole committee is more cumbersome, but I, that is really left to us as a committee to decide. It sounded like Dr. Rhodes felt strongly that a successor committee uh, was needed. So yeah, I'm I, curious. I do, I, I, I do, I, I, because if we do not have a successor committee, we will become just a memory. We, 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 we I agree. Be like, like, it would be like not having a progeny to carry our, our generation forward, or, you know, we, we can't, not having anyone, any group there that is present will ensure that we are not remembered uh, and that we will not have, a, there will not be a way to uh, dispense those funds in some coherent, organized fashion. So yes, there is, there is, on the front end uh, work that needs to be done. But once that committee is in place, that work doesn't have to be repeated again. It only has to be done once. So yes, I, I definitely believe we need to have a uh, successor group, whatever you want to call it, go forward. I, I'm very curious what uh, other members feel, and also to hear from this, uh, the from Jennifer and Pamela um, as well. Um, Dr. Shabazz, did you put your hand up? I, I can wait if someone else was. I I wanted yes, to say Eva. that I agree. I think that if we don't have a successor committee, then there has to be some kind of really formal town-supported body that moves the work forward. Because I agree with uh, with Irv that with Dr. Rhodes that this work will get buried. I mean, because because it's so multifaceted. There's so much information in there. So many different ways. So many things that who's going to be able to look at that? Who's not um, supposed to be focusing on that and make sure those things are 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 moved forward and implemented? I just I just don't see it happening unless there's a body to make sure that that happens. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, Ms. Bridges or Holler or Dr. Shabazz, do you wanna weigh in on that? <laughs> uh, I'm in agreement as well. Um, it doesn't have to meet weekly, it could be monthly. I don't know if it has mm -hmm. to be a town appointed something, but some body that is, yeah. Because things do get buried, they get lost, other things get prioritized and yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Hala. And that's a really great point that you're um, raising is that the charge could be very specific that the, the committee doesn't meet on a weekly basis. It doesn't meet, it's not, um, that it 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 has a very set schedule, even perhaps, um, so that folks who do want to consider membership are clear up front about what the expectations are for them um, to be a member of the group. Um, anyone, Ms. Bridges? I think I see. Yeah. You. Um, okay. Sorry, I, I don't see the little hand up, but um, we need to have somebody move forward. Uh, as we just spoke earlier, things get erased. Things get lost, um, and that always happens. I don't want it. To, I don't want to see it happen again. And um, once this committee, this assembly, gets it together of what we need to do, that needs to be moved forward um, with people that we know will move our work forward and not erase things that have already been erased and put back on. <laughs> we don't want them erased again. We don't want things to be lost and that's what happens. Thank you, Ms. Bridges, absolutely. Um, well, I, I'm in agreement with what I'm hearing from my colleagues. Um, I, I think there are a couple of different things from you all, from the report you all are, are giving us. Um, and I'd like to, before going to the successor question, talk about the money question. So what I'm hearing then is that, uh, the, the color of money is very specific 
And so if we're trying to create a $2 million fund, then let's have the very clear recommendations about to the, of, of what we're recommending to the council in regards to, um, and again, all we can do is recommend that they work to uh, establish that $2 million fund and uh, get it to a place where we can be clear on when um, revenues from that fund would be spendable, uh, not touching the principal, but first of all, getting the fund to 2 million, and then when would the revenues of that fund, again, going with the 5% idea, when would a 5% payout uh, from the 2 million uh, be available and uh, and then to to understand that is a time in which one could begin the, um, to work toward starting to draw from that fund specific funding for projects. Um, and so it seems to me between now and our next meeting, we ought to meditate on what is a realistic recommendation to make. And so, for example, I'm not sure how the budget is ending up for, for this past fiscal year and when the certification process will begin to look at unspent balances and, and begin to certify a certain amount of free cash. But how can we recommend that this fund be made such a priority as to going ahead and uh, maybe making a claim if there aren't other things, the entire free cash coming up be devoted. Um, next year, it could be different, but if there aren't pressing issues uh, as after the certified free cash is made this year, that one could look at how can one maximize the contribution from the certified free cash toward <laughs> creating the $2 million fund, and then take that up next year, take that up the year after that uh, in terms of what the amount be. And so um, we need to think about that and think about how to make a really clear and strong recommendation about reaching that financial goal. Secondly, I'm hearing what about the other funding streams and what will we recommend in our other uh, uh, relative to community development block grant funds, relative to uh, Community Preservation Act funds that we may have recommendations that would fall under that rubric, as well as I'll say even thirdly, grant writing, because there are actually private foundations, public resources that are out there um, that have called for proposals that reparative justice projects, uh, such as those we are recommending or maybe recommended in future, could very well be financed by uh, uh, those, um, those resources. So for example, the truth and reconciliation aspect of what we're recommending. There are foundations like the Kellogg Foundation, Kettering Foundation, other kinds of foundations, some of whom we even, our town may very well have a track record with that could approach and say, hey, uh, specifically as a model for other American towns, other American municipalities, we'd like to fund a, a truth and reconciliation initiative that ties in with our reparative justice plan, and we we'd like uh, you know two hundred thousand dollars. Could you put you know uh, or, or or whatever may be the amounts that they're granting? Uh, certain things are granting. So you know the the there are then perhaps three other buckets that will want to make um, clear recommendations to say 
that the community, the town council should uh, establish within the community uh, preservation uh, committee, act committee, um, a priority that projects within the four areas uh, of that are funded by CPA um, that relate to the African heritage community be given a certain priority relative to, to the funding that, that's available there. And then similarly around looking at community development block grant. Community development block grant, as I understand it though, would have to be about certain specific places in town, certain specific geographical locations that we would be requesting funding for related to, to reparative justice projects. So we have to think about where that, I mean, where that might be and how to make more specific, concrete recommendations about that rather than just say, oh, CDBG funds are out there for us too. And, um, and then thirdly, as I said, private foundation funding and the like that could perhaps support some of our initiatives. So all of this being said, then it takes us to then what happens after this report is, is turned in and the question of a successor body. And what I'm hearing though is that where we still need to be more directly thoughtful about is um, whether that successor body is one that is um, a creature of like as we have been for the last almost two years, is a creature of the town council and appointed by the town manager, or whether it should be a, perhaps something, a, a, a committee that is elected out of the representative assembly that we're recommending. So out of this black town meeting, a certain group is, uh, is vetted, is is approved, and um, and becomes that successor group to to move forward projects and proposals, both currently in our plan as well as those that may be brought from the community to to uh, 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 to want to go up to the town. And uh, and in other words, this goes back to our prior discussion of whether we see the successor group being more like a Jones Library Board of Trustees, that is something that is given its ch um, charge and, and selected by Black um, uh, residents uh, 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 of Amherst, and or whether we see it continuing to be uh, a creature of the town managers uh, and town council. And I think we need to just squarely take that question on, debate the pros and cons of each, and make a de decision about what our recommendation is going to be. Uh, I'm hearing right now, coming off of the that that from what how Sean is seeing it, that maybe it ought to be more of the Jones Library trustee kind of model. Uh, that is an independent uh, group of people charged with working with the town to carry out. The, the reparative justice plan and selected by uh, uh, African-American residents. Um, I'm not putting words in, in, in Sean's mouth, but sound as though he didn't think that the, um, uh, the future would lie in a, a, a permanent committee being created by the town council or, or a long-term committee being carried out by the law, by the council to keep this work going. That's what I'm hearing from you all's report. And I just think we need to then debate the pros and cons. And so maybe our liaisons can, can, can give us any, some other perspective to think about this, this question. But anyway, that's how I'm seeing it right now. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz, and just aware of the time. I know some folks have to leave. I really, I would very much like to hear um, uh, Pamela and Jennifer's perspective on this. Um, so what I, if, if people have just a few more minutes, if we could hear those perspectives, call our second period of public comment, um, and then at our next meeting on the 17th, um, I will just clarify 
And like I said, these were Sean's recommendations. He fully understands that we uh, are as a body, um, you know, in the position to make whatever recommendations we would like. Um, but I think that he genuinely is trying to steer us in a direction that he thinks will be embraced by the town council and the manager um, and that will carry the work forward. Um, and he even uh, sort of said that, you know, if if it's hard to keep people engaging on the committee to keep it, especially depending on how many folks, you know, numbers of people that you're having on the committee, um, that that could actually work instead of institutionalizing it with the town, that that could sort of work, in, 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 it could work to sort of reverse our progress um, if you're just trying to chase to get people to be on the committee. Um, so yes, please, Pamela, and then uh, we'll be able to come back to this next week first thing. And as Dr. Shabazz suggests, uh, debate it and formalize our recommendation. Pamela. So I'll be um, very, very quick. Uh, so I agree with Dr. Shabazz that the emphasis should really be on securing the funding as quickly as possible, because until you have that in place, you're not going to be um, really able to do that. If I heard uh, Dr. Rhodes correctly, there's about uh, 400,000 uh, available. So I would be working with Sean and others to think of a way to get the fund up and running in the next three years. So if you were able to count on $100,000 from the cannabis money and looked to a couple of other funds to secure you another 100,000 in three years time, you'd be at um, the place where you, you know, a million dollars at least. So that would get you, get you going. So I, I, that's where I would put my time and effort. And I think um, actually there are a couple of ways you can think about a successor organization. So providing support for the boards and, um, are, you know, it's very staff uh, heavy as far as the staff time of the, of the town. Um, so you could think of, creatively like you could think do we need a successor organization now or do we just need a small group to work on funding and then once the funding is in place should we have a successor organization that's one sort of creative way to think about it um, and then the other creative way would be to think about um, is this work something that could be part of the charge of an existing committee. So could it go to the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee as part of their overall work as another group that would be committed to pu pushing forth the work um, with the same sort of passion and commitment that you have? So I'll just stop there. Thank you, Pamela, both really helpful. And I just, uh, before we go to Jennifer, I just want to, um, in case folks who are listening, um, we haven't really maybe in a, in a previous meeting, we've talked explicitly about setting this uh, fund up as an endowment fund so that the interest that the fund gains is what we use, the investment money we, is what we use for initiatives um, and the principal stays locked in. Um, and so that's, I think that the council will see that as a real, uh, a really good model and a way to look at this. Um, the other thing that Sean said is uh, because we can all see that the cannabis money is declining, we and because the town has committed to this two million, we have a good argument in there for accelerating this because the town's committed. You can tell they've deepened the, the commitment has been deepened, um, and they've followed through on 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 what we've already discussed uh, now for two years. So. Yes, Jennifer, please. I was just going to comment on the, I really like the idea of the Black Town Hall. I do think that funding needs to come first and be the, prior, the, the, the priority as of now, but, and then figuring out the successor group. But I do like the idea of the Black Town meeting, mostly because our Black community is already very siloed and it's an opportunity to get the Black community to come together as one because we're, we are very siloed. And then um, as far as it goes for staff's work and, and the effort that they put in, you know, for someone who did town meeting and made packets for town meeting when we had town meeting, 
it's no different than having a, a committee that's going to meet monthly. You just do everything in one chunk of a time. So as far as I'm concerned with that, it, I don't really see a, a difference. And if you add this, you know, so that was yeah, really all I wanted to add. Far? <laughs> I've been here for 10 years. Yes, I go back that far. Town meeting at its finest. Um, so, so Jen, and it's also great. That last part one more time, just say that one more time, what you suggested in your last piece. Oh, I was just saying that the town, you know, having the town meeting is no different than having a, a monthly committee. You just do all of the work in in a chunk, right? So we had town meeting twice a year as opposed to having a group that met monthly. But I also see value in taking people from the black town meeting and having them operate in the same manner as like the select board. I see value in that because we're empowering our own black community. We're bringing people together. I just want the groups to not to have to use funds from uh, the AHRA to do things like create packets and mailings. And so you have to have someone to who's going to hold, who's going to carry the weight of that. Absolutely. Okay. That's what I thought you said. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's just pause here and call our second period of public comment. Um, Jennifer, for somebody who's coming on, on a phone number, how will they raise their hand? Is it pound nine or pound? Anyone remember? I, I have to leave. Okay. <laughs> Thank sorry. you, Yvonne. Yeah. No, great Bye. to see you. We'll see you Bye -bye. next week. Sorry, it's star nine. Star nine. Okay, so uh, if you would like to make public comment, this is our second public comment period. You can use the raise hand function. Um, if you are coming in on a phone number, star nine will uh, show us that you have your hand raised and we'll be able to bring you in as well. Brother North Star. Yeah, there's one person. I'm going All to right. go ahead and allow them to talk. That's what I'm that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, I just Welcome. got this. Well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. I just got the uh, a, a brief text to come in on, and I've been listening and um I've been hearing some really, really good things. And um some of the things that I heard, I of course. I, you know, uh, I don't know quite know the uh, terminology to all of that. I heard a lot of things, languages I haven't spoken in a, uh, quite a while. Uh, I'm I'm sort of a, a aesthetic, all over the place, and uh, but and um, but uh, let me see if I can draw a parallel line between some of the things that. Uh, Um, I heard the funds should be uh, acquisition immediately. And I agree with I agree with that, and um, and then the, um, you know an assembly, um, a successor assembly. Of course, uh, there has to be a lineage, you know, for where it 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 should all go, and so there has to be. Um, uh, to honor the process of of uh, ascertaining uh, the funds, you have that group, but then, yeah, the successor assembly should be uh, self determining people, people who is designated toward to determine for themselves, you know, um, and because we do believe in self determination and not having uh, overseers over us and to be able to know how uh, we want to move with that. And so uh, uh, I hang my hat on that hook very heavily. So <laughs> um, the, uh, um, yeah, I, get, I think that's about, uh, I think that's about all, all I would have to add to that. Please, pleased to meet each and every one of you. And thank you for inviting me to the call. Thank you so much for being here and for your comments. And um, hope that you'll come back to, 
to our to future meetings as well. Okay, um, is there anyone else who would like to make a comment? All right. So I'm not seeing any hands, uh, any other hands. And uh, just to remind us then, we will meet again the 17th next Monday at two o'clock. Um, in the meantime, we will have an updated draft that will go out and uh, I'll receive some clarification on some things that came up today. I will also be bringing back a report from my meeting with Paul and Lynn, and I welcome any questions that you might want me to bring to that meeting, which is happening tomorrow at 4 p.m. Um, and I think that is about it. If there are any assembly uh, member reports, this would be a good time. And if not, I can move to adjourn the meeting. I won't stand in the way of you adjourning, uh, except to say thank you again, Michelle, all your hard work, uh, particularly through, uh, you know, very, very difficult times, but to uh, keep keep our little ship moving, really do appreciate you for that, uh, standing firm. Uh, you know, Jennifer knows, uh, maybe others know, but Jennifer certainly knows, Brother Nosh Star brings a, brings a, a legacy, brings a history uh, working within the community, promoting recreation, promoting use of open space, a lot of the CPA funding kinds of things he, he can really give us good ideas on having promoted the old school, new, uh, new school, old young basketball games, having done so many things over the years. So, you know, this is what we count upon, uh, and, and, and look toward, you know, uh, uh, building on as we move in the future. But thank you again, everybody, for, for your time today. Thank you all, too. This is a great meeting. Um, and um, we'll go ahead and adjourn at 3.30 on the dot and see you next week. Have a great week.